Hello and welcome to another edition of Harona and I am Harona Drame. And tonight we have a young man we are talking to who is very renowned in his area of specialty. And uh, without any further ado, we will begin this interview. And as usual, with every episode of Harona, we begin from childhood. We talk about education, we talk about travels, we talk about chosen profession and why. Mm -hmm. And you know we do this because we want to inspire the next generation of young people who are desirous of choosing an area of specialty. My guest today is Pa Modu Jalo. Pa, welcome yes. to Harona. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. After some, what, almost 30 years, right? Almost 30 years. Uh, I left here in 1992, so it's been 30 years. But I've been going back and forth. I come and visit once in a while, but two, three weeks. But this is the longest I've been home for like in 30 years. I was here. I've been here since August. So. I'm, I'm going to take you even almost 50 <laughs> years ago. Talk about childhood and growing up in the Gambia. Yeah, I had an uh, incredible childhood in Gambia. Uh, I grew up in, half of my childhood was in Serekunda, uh, and my dad, and then we moved to Pipeline, and then I went to Mrs. Ndao as a kid. I started with Methodists up in Banjo, like everybody else, so, and I went to Mrs. Ndao, and then St. Augustine's graduated in 1992. Amazing childhood, still have my childhood friends that I grew up with from 10 years old till high school and stuff like that. So every time I come home, it's amazing to see everybody else. And, and I love it. I, uh, it's, it's home. Like, you know, it doesn't matter how long you've been out. But as soon as you come home, you still feel that, that there's something that just changes inside you when you come home. The warmth of the Gambia. The warmth of family. And you see everybody. And there's nothing like it. So it's always a pleasure coming home. Amazing childhood. What made it amazing? Uh, I had an amazing family. Like, my dad is all over the place. Like, I know, maybe you know my dad, OJ, but it's just like our house was like, we all grew up, the whole family was there. Like, my uncles, aunts, we all live in the same compound. My grandparents, so cousins, we all grew up together. So it was never a dull moment at the house. We always, and we had friends come to the house. So growing up, it was just this sense of community and sense of belonging. There was never a dull moment. There was never a sad time. Like every time you had somebody around and you had, you had good mentors. And like back in those days, you know, you, everybody was looking out for the kids. You know, you did something wrong in the neighborhood before you get home, your parents will get a phone call or you get punished from that time. And by the time you get home, you get another punishment too. Mm -hmm. So childhood was like always empowering and like always being given good advice. And everybody wanted to do something with their lives at that point because you wanted to be, pr to be, for your family to be proud of you because everybody was doing something at that point in your life. So. It was an amazing childhood, and my, my siblings are amazing. They've always been supportive, no matter what I've been to or what I've done, and my parents. So it's been, I couldn't ask for any better family and friends that I've ever had. Great, but uh, growing up, the games were important. So yes. what games were you playing with the friends that you had? Oh, I played soccer. I played Noritans. I played, I was big are on you basketball. Go, are you going to go there like they say, <coughs> it's called soccer? I saw this. Football. <laughs> Football. Sorry. <laughs> but no, no, I, I know people will give me, people will say stuff about that. Yeah. Yes. It's the American thing. So, but football, I played football. I ran track. Yeah. Big basketball player back in, in my high school days. Played for Saints. Uh, did a couple of years in college. Played basketball a couple of years in college. But it just didn't work out the way it's supposed to. But I was, I'm a big sports fan still. I still play for fun and still competitive. And I'm still competitive in my profession, so that competitiveness and the hunger for competition is still there. But I enjoy sports still today. Yeah. Who, who are the friends that you remember that you would spend most of your time with? Wow, uh, one of them is Sao Walos, Job, Sao Sao Job. Job. Uh, me and him from Form 1, uh, one of my other, other good friends is Momo de Seca, but he passed away a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, from but, Latikunda, right? Yeah, from Latikunda. Yes, yeah. He passed away yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah. Batan Bedu was yeah. one of Omar Jawara. Mm -hmm. All those guys. Mohamed Kanaji. I have like uh, Mustafa Jain. Mm -hmm. So we all, we still, whenever I come back to home, we still hang out. We still have lunch and stuff like that. So it's, and even when I'm not here, we still talk on WhatsApp. We have a 1992 class of 1992. That's about 100 of our students are participating. We put money together to help the schools and stuff like that. So we still, Connected, we're still far away with technology nowadays. It helps a lot to, inter, to still keep the connections and still check on each other and see how everybody's doing, whoever needs help. We could do whatever we can and stuff like that so everybody can have somebody to talk to and stuff like that. So it's been still, we, I know we're far away, but we still try to, try to keep connect. So it's been awesome. 
Been awesome, but uh, talking about childhood, usually before high school, we mm -hmm. all had our dreams yeah. of becoming. I mean, what was yours before high school? Oh, before high school, I, I wanted to be an engineer. I, that was my thing. I wanted to be a civil engineer. I wanted, I wanted to build like bridges and stuff like that. That was my thing. And I even when I went to the States, that's what I went to school for. I started school to be an engineer, went to Southern University in, La in Louisiana. I was there, but my path changed because. Every summer or winter, I would leave and go to New York. My aunt used to live in New York, and I would go there for the summer. Then I found a job at the kitchen. My cousin was working there, Alaji Samba, and he offered me a job to work in the kitchen. TGI Fridays, back in the day, big, mm. big chain restaurant. So I worked in the kitchen. I think, like, the first day I worked in the kitchen, I knew there, there was, was a something. This is, it was chaotic. Like, everything was out of the... Like, I've never been in a kitchen like that. I've been in kitchens at home and stuff like that, but Huge. in a full functioning commercial restaurant kitchen. And TJ Fridays back in the day was like one of the top hmm. restaurants big in America back in those days. So it was, it was mind blowing, but I felt so comfortable and I felt like I found my place in a way. So, and that was that. And I started doing that and I decided, I stopped my engineering degree decided that's the path I wanted to take. And I did that for, since I was, what, 20 years old. I've been in the kitchen since I was 20. Oh, we don't want to say how old you are. <laughs> <laughs> but coming back to Gambia, that's, you know, when we go to high school still, you, yeah. know, you get inspired. Yeah. I mean, you look forward to becoming, you know, yeah. you have a mentor, you have an idol. Mm -hmm. Did you have any of those that you were like, well, I want to be when I grow up? Yeah, I had like the, the, for me, my mentor was not like actually like a profession. I, for me, the mentorship that I was looking at was my, my uncles and my uncle's friends that they were doing things that they were passionate about. Like they went to school for that, but they were passionate about it. They didn't just do it for maybe like it was the title of the job or whatever it is. Like my, my dad's uh, elder, eldest brother went to India to study journalism. So... Journalism back in those days is not like a high-paying job or stuff like that. Still is not. I can tell <laughs> you that. <laughs> but the avenues back in those days was not like a lot of things like that. But he was passionate about that. And he's still passionate about that. So for me, it was like when I saw like friends of my dad's and my uncle's friends finding their avenues in life and doing things that they were passionate about. And they weren't scared. It was a scare, it's a scary thing. Growing up now, figuring it out, I know it's a scary thing. But they make it look so effortless to them. Mm -hmm. So they make it look so effortless doing what they will love and finding new, uh, new avenues, creating new business ventures in Gambia that were out of the box. Like my uncle was, my dad's brother started collecting jewel brew bottles and created a business out of that. Because back in the days, nobody collected the bottles. So he used to collect them and then sell it back to jewel brew. And that was his business. That's how he made enough money to go to Norway and help him create something out of nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. So those are the little things that were the mentorship and uh, the, et the ethics, like the work ethic that I see from my dad and waking up every morning, you know, it didn't matter what it was. Work was work, you know, putting the work in, be professional, having to do it the right way and not cutting corners, doing it, everything the way it's supposed to be done. So for me, that was my mentors. Those are the people that drive me to be want to be better. Uh, my guest today is Pamodu Jalo. We're going to take our first break. When we come back, we'll talk more about high school, mm -hmm. education, and what inspirations led to the chosen profession mm -hmm. that he is so passionate about as we speak. We'll be right back. Talk till you drop. Enjoy free calls every morning between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. Pay for the first minute and the rest of your call is free. Nothing beats this. Let the conversation begin. Double the data, double the fun, only on AfriMoney. Buzz Bundle. To enjoy the Buzz Bundle on AfriMoney, dial star 777 hash and double your data for as low as $10 and get 80 megabytes. And also, receive 3 gigabytes of data for only $150. There's more. There's more. Just dial star 777 hash to find out. All bundles are valid for 7 days. To cash in, visit our nearest AfriMoney agent. AfriMoney. Send money anywhere, anytime. Welcome back to Harona, and I am Harona Drame. My guest today is Pa Modu Jalo. Pa, you know, uh, choosing high school, mm -hmm. usually, I mean, I know St. Augustine's is a big deal, yeah. right? To all of back us. Back in the day. Has been. Always has been. 
Yeah. But why not Gambia High? Uh, why not Muslim High? Why not somewhere else? It was just like my dad went to high St. Augustine's. I think most of my uncles went to St. Augustine's. And as a boy back in those days, getting into St. Augustine's was you didn't my want dream. to go to girls high school in Gambia uh? High, right? <laughs> <laughs> we had St. Joseph next door, so that, yeah. was, that, was, that was good. But it was just a dream when you were a kid. Like, I was a dream to just go to St. Augustine's. And, that's, and my, sisters went to, my sister went to Gambia High. And so I, all my sisters went to different schools. But I always wanted to be going to St. Augustine's. That was not Gambia. I didn't have any other choices. That was the one place I wanted to go. How do you describe life at St. Augustine's from one to five? Exciting. Uh, there were some challenges, you know, but that's exciting. There is so many stories that, you know, you have, you create these bonds that just, like you said, they are lifetime. Like, it's one of those things that is, you can't explain it. You meet people and they become part of your life and they just, they're just there. And it doesn't matter what it is. You don't see them for 30 years and you see them again and it feels like yesterday you saw each other. Like, mm -hmm. I just saw some of my friends. We went to, the, to San Augustine. We, were, we did some equipment for the chemistry labs and stuff like that and somebody, everybody came down when we were, and they were giving us a thank you and then some of these guys I haven't seen since we graduated. Mm -hmm. And we just picked up, like, we just, were from, we just left class and then, and that's some of the childhood things that you can't, there is nothing, you can't buy stuff like that and it's genuine and it's, it's loving and it's, it's like one of those things like, you know, and that was the thing and then you build on that and then you have, the school was like run, Greatly, there was discipline, there was mentors, there was like, you had Savali, you know, back in those days playing yeah. sports, you know, yeah. everybody knows Savali, but he was like the enforcer kind of thing. But mm -hmm. now we see him, you tell about stories, and then everybody's laughing about it. But mm -hmm. having him around help us be men and be responsible and guide us not to f go too far. You know, you dodge class and stuff like that, but you still, and there was this competition of like, Education. Everybody wanted to be. We did all the crazy stuff, but everybody wanted to have good grades, because no. there was this competition about like who's got the best grades. After we get out, you know, you we check in each other. So it kind of make us want to do better. Mm -hmm. And that was the only, and still today, all of us are doing great. But it helps us to do it where we come today because of those connections and those people and having that that group of friends around you and that help you and shape you and guide you when you, sometimes you kind of mess up and they'll talk you out of it. You know, you can't talk to your parents some other times, but these are the friends that you trust enough that you have that trust that you could talk to them and they can help you maybe figure things out that you're going through your life that you can't talk to anybody else. And it's, those are priceless and you can, there's no way you can find stuff like that anywhere else. Basketball. I watched you play basketball so many <laughs> times. Yeah. I, I am surprised that you didn't make it to the NBA. Yeah. For us, you were like a phenomenal <laughs> basketball yeah. star. And then it was a matter of getting to the U.S. Yeah. and you'll be drafted. Yeah, I, I did play a couple of years, have some injuries, and that, you know, that always doesn't help your cause and stuff like that. And then, you know, you beat yourself. You, you got kind of depressed for a while and stuff like that. But then I found another passion. And that was the other thing. And I found my way into a kitchen. And then, but basketball has been my passion since I was like 10, 12 years old. I played and I was pretty good. But, you know, sometimes it's not, it's not what life throws, you know, sometimes life throws curveballs at you. And it depends on how you deal with it. And uh, it still hurts once in a while when I think about it because it was a dream. But it, some dreams just don't come true. And, but I'm, I'm okay with it. I've, I've learned to live with it. Mm. <laughs> And like I said, I found another passion and another escape to be competitive, to, to give me a drive, to give me something to focus on, to want me to be better at something. I, and I'm always striving to be better every day when I wake up. So it's a good thing. TGI Fridays. Yes. Is the connection to the kitchen. Yes. That's where it all started. And before then, you didn't really, it wasn't a thing. I've never liked... Before TJ Friday. So you were going to bridge Banjul Bara? Yeah, you were going pretty to much. That was, like the, that. that was the thing, but walked into the kitchen and that was the thing. And I cooked back home, like helped my mom in the kitchen, maybe cut onions. But it, I was okay. I, I enjoyed having to be in the kitchen, but it was never in my mind like that I would ever be a chef. That was never, a, never coming across my head. But I walked into the kitchen and something clicked. And I was good at it from the beginning. Like by the time I was like there for like a month, I could walk every station in the kitchen because I just, I picked everything up effortlessly. Like it was just like my chefs were like, you've never cooked before. I'm like, no, they, they just couldn't believe it. Like, and that was that. And then 
After that, I become a corporate trainer, so I travel all over the country, and some went to England and stuff like that to open restaurants. Who's a corporate trainer? A corporate trainer, you go to new restaurants when they build it up, uh, set up kitchens, design it, sometimes help design the kitchen, train the people, and you're there for like a month or two, make sure everything is done the right way, train the people, and walk them through the process until you, they feel like they are ready to go, then you move on to the next. More so like a consultancy, sort of. Yeah, yeah okay. but it was, the, it was part of the part of the TJ Friday. So we come okay. in there, there's nothing in there. Most of the okay. time, the building's not ready yet. We make sure everything is where it's supposed to be. All the equipment is there. Set up everything else. We have training classes, teach the people the recipes, teach them how to cook, set up the stations, what, what happens where, mm -hmm. how to run when it's busy, how to... So it's like having a their own students and then bringing them up until to speed, until where you think like they're up to where they're supposed to be, then we move up to the next. So I did that for about four or five years. So, and I enjoyed that, I enjoyed that. That was one of my, one of my first favorite things that I've ever most done. Like because when you I was, change cities. Because I change cities, states. change the environment, different people, and it's always seen like something that from nothing. Yeah. And then you build it up, and then when you leave and you stand and you watch, you watch the kitchen go. We did this. Like, yeah, you, you say, we did that. Yeah. And it's like everything is working the way it's supposed to. Everything is working in, in smooth. Everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. So it's humbling and it's gratifying. So that was one of my favorite. And I get to travel around the country on somebody else's dime. So I got to see the country. So yeah. that was fun, too, getting to see America in a, in a way like that and meeting people. That was, that's the one thing I enjoy most about being in the restaurant, is just meeting different people every time. Like, every day is a different day. Yeah. You never have the same day ever again. Every day is different. The vibe is different. The people are different. What ch how, the challenges you face are different. So it's, that's what I, I look forward to stuff like that. Yeah, it's great to, to really change environments mm -hmm. and be so passionate about your job. Mm -hmm. But after TGI Fridays, mm -hmm. what? What was next? After TGI Fridays, uh, I decided to finish up college and I got my culinary degree. And then I, I took up, uh, become like uh, sous chefs, like learning on different chefs. Mm -hmm. And I went, to, I did fine dining for a while, like James Beard, uh, one of my first chefs was the James Beard nominee. That's like a, a very high honor to have in the chef world. And I worked with him for about two years. And then I, I was in Phoenix, Arizona. And then after that, I moved to Seattle. And I was a sous chef at a restaurant that was like a farm to table kind of thing that was, I've never, I like doing stuff like that would teach me because I've never done this thing. And it was called Local 360 because Everything we used in the kitchen was 360 miles from the restaurant. So if it's not only 360 miles from the restaurant, we can't use it. Mm -hmm. So we had to use, we couldn't have like avocado because there's no avocado in like Seattle. So, and every day, like farmers will come with their vans, with their veggies, and they open their truck, and then we will go in the truck, and then we, whatever we find, we create a menu out of that. Mm -hmm. So I've never, so I wanted to learn stuff like that. So I did that for a couple of years, and then I took over an executive job as a, at a, it's a music venue, but they do dinners and music. Mm -hmm. So it was... Live band? Live band. Okay. Awesome place. Awesome music. They have very good bands. But it was crazy because everybody comes and sits down at the same time. So we'll have like 200 people just come and sit down. And they want to eat in an hour before the band starts. So, you, so I went from a place that you would know it was like free range. I could do whatever I wanted. And I come to another one that was structured that I have to... Structure it to the point like every minute counts. And everybody in the had two. to choose what they want. Yeah, there it's was a no full menu. menu. It's not a set menu. It's an open menu, so any table can order different things. So two me two hours of chaos, and then you stop. So no mission plus nothing. <laughs> huh? No mission plus nothing. You just have to begin from zero. No, we do that. It will come in the morning. You okay. will prep, we'll prep for the menu okay. and everything like that. But then you know at like seven o'clock. You got 200 people walking through the door, and they sit down by 7:30. They want to eat by like the show starts at like nine, so in that two hours, they'll have like the appetizers, then a dessert, and then you want to clean up, and so they, everybody will ready for their stuff like that. And that was a that was a whole new another system I've never done before, but it was challenging at the beginning. But for me, I like to challenge myself and try to start new things. And I wanted I didn't want to go back to the corporate setting, so I wanted to do small small restaurants like stuff like that. Because that way, it gives me a chance to be creative. 
I had total control of the menu. I could create it however I wanted to. I could do new ideas. I could think of a crazy idea and I could put it in the menu. And as long as I cast it out right, I made sure we were making money, the owners were happy, hand happy and, and the stuff like that was amazing for me. And then I left that place, went to another restaurant called Levitate. That was a gastro pub, so it was a whole other, more laid back, mm -hmm. more relaxed. And that was one of my favorite because I was given, my other owners were kind of say something, but this guy was like, you do whatever you want. As long as we make money. As long as we make money. So yeah. I was excited. So I was throwing oxtail. I was doing like jerk chickens. I did some domoda in there. I did, and, and everything was selling. And like, and it was a small community. And most of the stuff I was doing, they've never seen before. So they were excited. So every time I create, and I will change my menu three times a year. Every season, I'll, I'll do what was seasonal, so I'll use the veggies that were seasonal, so I'll change the menu and stuff like that. So I had a big following, and still have a big following in Issaquah, it's in Issaquah, Washington. So that was, so stuff like that, I love, I stopped the corporate world and I decided to just do small business and one owner restaurants, and that's what I've been doing for the last five to seven years. We'll take a second break. When we come back, the last words with Pamodu Jalo. Mm -hmm. This is Arona. And I am Harana Rana. Do you enjoy spending time online with your friends on social media? If so, then Africell has the best offer for you. Activate the social media bundle for $10 is only and enjoy 40 megabytes valid for 24 hours. WhatsApp, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, and Viber all for $10 is only. Dial 120 hash and press 3 to activate the social media bundle. No need to subscribe every day. It will automatically roll over for your enjoyment. Africell social media bundle. Let us socialize. Welcome back to Harona with my guest, Pa Modu Jalo. Pa, we, we, we don't find this cooking kind of a Gambian male thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of us, when we travel, we help the wives in the kitchen, mm -hmm. we do stuff. When we are in Europe, well, we don't I mean, do we do laundry, <laughs> yeah. house cleaning, cooking. Yeah. We help in every way we yeah. can. But the minute we touch down on the Union International Airport, that's the last time we'll be in the kitchen. Yeah. So what do you think? I mean, it's, it's very funny. Gambians abroad and Gambians at home. I, I'm not, I don't know. I, I just, I don't, I'm not okay with that. I think like if you were able to do it in the United States and you were helping your wife and helping with stuff like that, I don't see why you should stop coming to Gambia. I think you should do, help and show your kids that it's okay to do that, to help your wife, to be help, helping in the house and stuff like that. Because you know what? However you want to shape it in the end, if they go back to the United States or they travel or whatever it is, they will do that. So I don't understand when you could do it in another country and you were doing it right there, but you come home instead of to empower the next generation to see that that's, that's a thing that you can do to help your family, help your wife, and be part of, to be like a, a, a joint venture instead of like, now I'm just going to sit around and don't do anything. I'm not okay with that. I, I don't see why that's okay. I, I still, when I'm home, I cook, I clean, I help, but I guess every man for his, his thing. But I think like they should, I think if you've done it before and you were doing it in the States I don't, or anywhere in Europe, I don't see why you shouldn't do it at home. I just don't see what the, what, why, you why you come home and don't do that. Raising the kids, the kids will play, the boys will play <coughs> their cartoons, they will do stuff. Yeah. Girls will be helping their mothers yeah. in the kitchen and doing house chores, etc. I mean, that's still the upbringing. That environment is really uh, not 2022 material. What but, do you think? But the, I, but the thing, like, that's, that's, that's what I don't understand because that generation, like you're talking about, the ones that are, they are supposed to change that status quo. Mm -hmm. Like we are supposed to come and show that this is what can happen. Like to show the kids that this is okay. This is, like a girl can say, I don't want to cook. It's okay that they don't want to cook. They can learn how to cook, but that's not supposed to be like, that is your main purpose in life or what, that's what it, because you're supposed to be a wife and that's what it is. Like we have a lot of powerful women that are lawyers. They know how to cook, but they, most of them maybe don't like to cook that much. But maybe you have, you have a son that most likes to cook, and I bet you they will, they will kick him out of the kitchen and say, don't cook. But we have to stay, change the status quo, because being a chef or is a good profession as anything else. You make so much money as most people that are making. You could make hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars do being a chef, and it's a legitimate business. And I think like, we have to change that narrative that you're not supposed to be in the kitchen because you're a boy or when like, it's only the wife that's supposed to do it. I think it's supposed to be a collaboration as a family, because if you want your family to be stronger, I think when you do that, it changes 
that's how we change the status quo. If we don't do that, then it's just gonna, that's we're going to keep staying where we are. Staying where we are, but we, I think it's important for somebody like you and how far you've come mm -hmm. being a chef. It's a good idea to speak to young boys, mm -hmm. men, who really are thinking, yeah. but society is not as welcoming, yeah. or, I mean, even their parents. Yes. Mothers themselves will tell the boys, Lidu ya figur, you know. I mean, and it's, it's sad that we look at things in that, in that way. But what do you say to those young people who are aspiring to become future chefs, etc., cetera, or, or just do it out of a hobby and not even a profession? I think like if you if you want if you're passionate about it, I know your parents might not understand it, but find a job that you could get make. I think like most of the time it's most of, because it's this money. I think they think about professions and money. They see like if you're not a lawyer or a banker or a banker or a engineer or, engineer or whatever it is, then you can you can support a family. And I think that's that's where we need to get away from. You could be a chef, a, a cook or whatever it is, and then you can still support your family. And I think like maybe you show them Maybe you show them videos, you show them chefs that are out there that are doing amazing things, you create stuff, and you teach them. I think sometimes it's just because they don't know and they don't know how to deal with the situation because that's all they know. That's all we've been told since we were kids, like, you have to be a lawyer, you have to be this to, to, be, to be successful. If you want to be this, then you're not going to make it. But now that they've seen that, like, I'm a Gambian and I've made it. Like, there's a lot of Gambian chefs out there in Europe and in America and stuff like that. There's some Gambian chefs in Gambia right here that are doing amazing stuff. And maybe you tell your mom, you, you, you explain stuff like that to him. You take him to maybe the restaurants those chefs are and say, look, look at what he's doing. And just open their minds. I think if you explain it to them and talk to them about it, instead of just making like a, an argument or a battle, instead of explaining it and sitting down and having a conversation about it, I think they maybe they'll, because they want you to succeed. They want you to be happy as a parent. Every parent wants their kids to be successful. They just are scared, thinking like that will not make you successful. So you just have to have that conversation and explain what you're trying to do and what your dream is and what the goal that you're looking for. And you're still going to get that education because you're still going to have to go through school to be a great chef if you want to be that. Uh, as we bring this conversation to an end, yeah. you have two minutes. Yeah. Anything you want to share? Yeah, I think uh, the Gambian, Restaurant business is, is flourishing. I think we had, I'm excited to see that there's a lot of restaurants and stuff like that. But I think they just have to start thinking outside the box. I think they, everybody like kind of doing the same thing. I think they should start thinking outside the box, go out there and try to infuse other cultures, other cuisines with Gambian cuisine. That doesn't mean you are cheating the Gambian cuisine because if you go anywhere in the world nowadays, there's, the cuisines are all mixed together. And to be creative and stuff like that, you have to find other people outside, the, outside your comfort zone to do stuff like that. And I think like, we just have to be more focused on a little bit of, on customer service and stuff like that. Just, there's little things that we have to do to be better, but I think we have a bright future when it comes to like, the restaurant business and the food world because we have everything that chefs will kill for in the outside world. We have fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, fish, anything you want. You can get it today, like fresh ones. And that's what people are paying a lot of money for in Europe, and we have it here. We just have to find a way to cultivate it and maybe better farming about it and then expose the other rest of the world that we are here. And I bet you if we do that, instead of having the, the tourism seasonally, we become tourism all year round because we become a destination for something else instead of just tourism. And I think that's what we need to figure out a way to do because Gambia is beautiful all year round. We have to figure out a way to market that and if it has to come through food or anything else. But I think like nowadays people, food is a destination thing for most people when they travel to find places that are giving out new ideas or fresh things or stuff like that. And if we try to many, use that as a, as a vehicle and help with the tourism and then they'll tell their friends and stuff like that, and then I think we'll flourish. Thank you very much, Pam Oru Jalo. It's a pleasure having you on Harona. Thank you for having me. It was a great experience, and I really appreciate it. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>